I tell you, what a dashing figure you're cutting this evening. I thought it was Sean Connery striding over to me. Well, somebody once said I gave every impression of having been somewhat hastily constructed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it just cracks me up. I'm sorry, I'm going away. <laughs> I do apologise. It's a pleasure having you on. Now, I believe you're a Woodhouse fan as well. Very much so. Have you seen Stephen and Hughes? Uh... I have indeed. And I think for the first time, they've got it right. They've been, they've been various efforts at doing Jeeves and Wooster. And I don't think anyone's got it right before. But you have. Congratulations. Oh, fine. 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 Why do you think it's endured? Why do you think people are still, you know, interested and find it, find it works? Why does Woodhouse stuff still uh, catch an audience? I think, really, because it is in its way unlike anything else. I mean, he created an entirely new kind of comic medium. He did it superbly well. And no one else had really tried to follow it on, and not successfully anyway. So I suppose because, um, in a way, they're period pieces, and I think they've done it so very well in this particular series, because you haven't attempted to modernise it, that'll be absolutely fatal. It's gone right, it's gone right back to the music, the cars, everything else. I'll tell you what, I bet you're very glad you did it right, aren't you, now? Yeah. <laughs> he wouldn't have let you out of here alive, yeah, otherwise. I think you're probably right. Patrick, let me ask you, how long has Sky at Night been running for now? Um, a third of a century. Um, 33 and a third years. Uh, when it started, I was quite young. I had black hair, for example. It was a long time ago now. <laughs> yeah, we, we, did, we did our first one in April 1957. We were ushered in by a comet, the Adam the Roland Comet. And I thought that was rather a good omen. Well, the last one, the last show we did, was um, last week. And uh, we hope we have another bright comet, and it's been a flop. <laughs> oh, that's a terrible shame. I, I was personally very cut up about that. Yes, it was. Do I do I we covered admirably. I've complained bitterly about it, yes. how, how long can you continue, then? You've been for 33 years now. How long do you intend to keep going? Well, as long, as long as I can, as long as the BBC want me, and as long as people want to listen. I mean, I'm quite young, I'm only 67. Well, there you are, a stripling youth. Certainly. Um, <laughs> now, what is there to look forward to at the moment? What excites you? Are there big things happening in the heavens? What happened in the world of astronomy? What is there coming up? Well, various things. Of course, the main thing has been the launching of what we call the Hubble Space Telescope, named Hubble after the great American astronomer, Edwin Hubble, the first man who really demonstrated what the universe is like, and whom I knew personally. Um, this is a huge telescope with a mirror 94 inches across. Good heavens. And that's been sent into space, and it's now going around the Earth at a height of about 300 miles. Now, the and pictures... just sent back pictures. Well, and they're not awfully good, are they? Let's be honest. Well, they are, and they are much more spectacular than you might think. They don't look up to much, but they... the vital thing about this first picture is that it shows that the telescope actually works. It's pointing in the right direction. It's getting very faint things. But, but I must be honest with you, frankly, well. they're the basic things one would expect up front, aren't they? I mean, that's nothing to boast about, you know. They actually spend millions. It's, it's billions they spend. No, and, it, and it works, it and it's pointing in the right direction. Actually, it is. <laughs> it's the most incredibly complex thing. It's not oh, yeah. really adjusted yet. But the fact that it has been launched successfully, and uh, all the various mechanics, have been, all the first problems have been overcome, show that it really will do, I think, that everything that everybody hoped of it. And it's going to increase our knowledge of the universe tremendously. Now, what's, they've just discovered a new star with it, I believe. That's one of the No, things. it's um, a star that's been known for some time, but this particular telescope uh, shows that it's made up of two stars very close together. And the importance of that is not in the star itself, which is frankly totally unimportant, but the fact that this particular telescope will show that more clearly than any, uh, has ever been done before. It's... And bear in mind, this is not the largest telescope ever built. I mean, the largest telescope ever built has a, much, a mirror much larger than that. But this one's going round the Earth, above the atmosphere, and therefore it hasn't got to look through the Earth's dirty, unsteady air. And that's where its advantage lies. Unlike the rest of us who have to look through the, the Earth. Absolutely so. Did, did some, I mean, did you ever think there would be technology like that when, when you first started out, your interest in astronomy? I did, uh, and I thought men would get to the moon in my time. And I knew there'd be space satellites, and I thought there would be space stations and space telescopes. But I got the scale wrong. My old friend Arthur Clarke got it right. He was saying that men would get to the moon round about 1970, and of course they did. And he was bang on the button there, wasn't he? He was bang on it. Well, I was saying men would get to the moon in the 1980s, so I was about 15 years wrong. So what's happening now is something that I thought would happen round about the turn of the century. You look rather dazed by all this, Hugh, understandably. Um, no, yes, it's not my subject, I have to admit. Um, <laughs> but maybe you'll think of taking it up before I you come on the show will, next yes, time. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's gripping stuff, gripping stuff. But I, I know nothing. I don't know Uranus from mine. <laughs> oh, no. That... <laughs> what an incredibly <laughs> cheap shot that was. Don't. Really don't... No, 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 no. Certainly don't applaud that, please. You should go straight to the you, bottom of the comedy cast for that one, yes. Yeah. You forget, must be so tired of that joke, forget, don't you? You must have had that for 33 don't years. Don't forget it was a French novelist who first invented the term of working the penis around the sun. Uh, no, I won't. Yeah, never forget that. <laughs> <laughs> never forget that, Wait, whatever you do. I, have, I forgot have, it when I was about 18, but I remember. Have you, have you never heard of the Zola system? Ah, uh, 
Oh, oh that's, let's good. please let's go back to this bit because this is shockingly bad stuff <laughs> no, that's coming out of both of you. Sorry. Now at the moment in the news as well, there's a, there's a space station, the Mir space station, I believe. Yes. The space station. What's happening up there? They're trying to repair something. No, uh, the space station, the Mir space station, is perfectly all right. Uh, they're going. The Russians go up and down to it by their ferry rockets, and one of these has developed a fault. And of course, there've been all kinds of scare stories about it. Certainly, uh, the insulation does need to be repaired. And uh, obviously, space is a very dangerous kind of place. It's a dangerous environment. And it's absurd to say there's no risk. Of course there is. But I will say that, so far as we can tell, the spacemen are not in any immediate danger. It's a question of either repairing the ferry they've got or literally sending up a new one. And the Russians do have a craft standing by to do precisely that. So I don't anticipate any tragedy there, but don't let's be too overconfident at the same time. But with, with this sort of risk and, and the, with the cost involved, why do we keep doing that? Why do we keep sending men up into space? What's the point of it? Well, this is the old, old question. First of all, so far as the risk is concerned, there have been far fewer lives lost in the development of astronautics than there were at a comparable stage in aeronautics. That's one point number one. But when aeronautics you talk about cost, is immediately beneficial, isn't when it? You talk mean, about, we... Well, it's in fact, when you talk about the cost, you see, every branch of science is now related to every other branch of science. And uh, I'm rather reminded of the remark made by a very famous last century scientist when asked, what was the good of this pointless new science of electricity? And he replied, Madam, what is the good of a newborn baby? You see, everything leads on to everything else. And when you come and talk about the cost... Hold on one second, right, I don't quite I know, see how electricity moment. leads on to a newborn baby, necessarily. You must well, be doing it a very different way to the rest of us, Patrick. <laughs> no, the point being... How are your batteries, by the way? <laughs> no, but the point is, in being sensible about it, we can. <laughs> when you look at the cost, and equate that with um, defence or a nuclear submarine, it doesn't cost very much. And the results are tremendously beneficial. For example, would you like to find a way of um, curing cancer? I certainly would. Exactly. Well, the best way to do that, so far as we can tell, and I'm no medical man, is by radiation. Therefore, we want to study radiations as closely as we can. But in the short term, here, but in the short term... Let me finish, please. Down here, <laughs> many of the radiations are blocked out by the Earth's air. The study of those go up. Uh, this is what I want to ask you about, because in the short term, though, there are certainly more pressing problems. I mean, we've got the ozone layer, he's, he's stripping away faster than Phil Collins' hair at the moment. We're losing it <laughs> every day. Maybe that is something we should spend the money on instead. I, I'm, you know, you mentioned defence and you mentioned nuclear submarines there. I don't think they're... That's money wise. they spent Now, what you don't realise is, you see, that in point of fact, the amount of money spent on space research by national budgets is remarkably low. It sounds a great deal, but it's not very much when you consider uh, other things. For example, in the most expensive year that NASA ever had, when they were sending up spacecraft and sending probes to the moon, they spent on space research exactly the same amount as they spent on military intelligence alone. And when you equate a spacecraft with a nuclear submarine, or look at, look at which costs the more, you'd have rather a shock. That, you see, is where people just don't do their homework. So it's expect. perspective, really. If we put it in perspective, it's... It's not people so who say that kind of thing just don't do their homework. Well, I haven't done any homework, obviously, Patrick. Uh, I see no, you're, you're you getting... are right there. I am right there. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> you agree on one point. Would you, would you actually have liked to have travelled in space? Is that something... I would love to have gone into space, but there are uh, several objections to that. For one thing, I am too old. Secondly, it would need a very massive rocket to launch me. <laughs> <laughs> but weren't we supposed... We've never had a, a British astronaut, I believe, have we? No, there were two British astronauts being trained in the Juno programme, but that seems to have foundered. And um, there will be British astronauts, undoubtedly. There was, in fact, one astronaut who was a British astronaut who was under training with the Americans at a fairly early stage. But one of the qualifications is you have to be able to handle a, a high-flying jet aircraft. And, if you can't do that, uh, you didn't get through, and he wasn't able to do that. But I'm quite sure that there will be a British astronaut sometime in the 1990s. And uh, going further forward, of course, the first man on Mars may have been born, I don't know. Right, that would be an interesting would thought, wouldn't indeed. it? Uh, well, talking of going to Mars and other places, do you actually think there is life out there on other planets? I'm quite sure there's plenty of life up there, but not in our own particular solar system. Because the only world in our own particular family of planets that is suited for intelligent life is our own Earth. The others are not. Well, all the stars are suns. There are 100,000 million suns in our galaxy alone, and that's only the star. And I refuse to believe that our own perfectly ordinary, unimportant sun is the only one to have an inhabited planet going around it. That makes no sense at all, because saying that's one thing and proving it's quite another. But well, this is something, obviously, that's probably the only thing you have in common with Michael Jackson, of course, your belief in aliens. Uh, maybe you two could get together. He's building a little landing pad for them. I didn't know if you know that. Uh, no, well, best of luck, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> are you still a key musician? I know you used to play... Uh... Oh, yes. Um, I'm very much an amateur. I've never had a music lesson in my life, but I potter around playing things like um, pianos and xylophones and things like that. Yes, well, marvellous. Well, 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 if you can ask you to shove up the couch a little bit as we introduce our next guest now. But... 
How do you do? Delighted you? to meet you here. Good Thank heavens. You. Here we are then. Well, that's some outfit you got on there, Phoebe. That's Thank lovely. Thank you, John. I brought you a present. What is that? Well, it's a fur bikini. I'm sorry I lost the bottom part in Khan. I'm sure you did. Lovely. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so I said, I love the outfit. Was there a fire in the hotel and you just rushed straight out? Would that be... Uh... This is uh, one of my own designs. This is lingerie légère. And since it's so difficult for women artists to be recognised in New York City, I've found that I've had to put the paintings right on my clothes. It's the only way I can get any recognition from men. There we are. <laughs> wow. I still don't think it's got the... I still don't think it's got the... Uh... <laughs> You old devil, you. <laughs> you have got full batteries in tonight, haven't you? There you go. Now, you've just come from camp. <laughs> Hugh Laurie, Patrick Moore and Phoebe Legere. Oh,